right, another episode of Technical Explanation. As always, I'm excited. I hope you guys are too. If it's your first time tuning in, uh, Technical Explanation is uh, it's, it's a podcast uh, right now. It's a video cast, I guess. Um, but it's it's really got a pretty simple um, goal. We are trying to tell the stories of wrestling officials in an effort to uh, let people know they they put on their pants just like us one leg at a time, and also to hopefully inspire the next generation of officials because. Um, uh, with all my guests, you can see these wrestling stories go on for a long time. And I think today uh, on this episode, you're, you're going to see, how, uh, you're going to hear that, you're going to see that, but this is just the beginning of a wrestling story uh, for Evan Burchett. Um, he's he's right outside Atlanta in Georgia. I'm glad Evan helped. Uh, thank you. First of all, you helped me check off a state box. Now I'm trying to get all 50 in, um, but that's enough out of me. Evan, say hello to everyone. How you doing today? How's it going, world? Uh, blessing to be here uh, with Bryce. I love what he's doing um, with the Matt Media there in Ohio, the people that he's got on the podcast, his story himself. Um, every conversation that we've had has been top notch, and I'm looking forward to another great one here. Yeah, well, that's up to you, man. <laughs> no, I just, uh, I, I just yeah. like, hey, uh, you know, we, we always we, we tell wrestling stories here. That's what we're here to do. Um, and and for you, yours starts in the Pacific Northwest, um, which is um, I I've never spoke with a wrestler from the Pacific Northwest. I know of some. I know some people that have moved from Ohio out there and everything. Um, so tell me, like, how old were you when you started wrestling? It's well, my story began in the Pacific Northwest, and yeah. I guess you could say my wrestling story because um part of the reason why i got into wrestling not until i got to georgia uh much later in life but part of the reason i got into it was my aggressive nature i was an aggressive child i was a rambunctious child um very competitive but i moved to to the southeast um pretty early on and i was a baseball guy up until sophomore year in high school well really just before that um I had a buddy, Eli, that was originally from Nebraska, and Nebraska is a big wrestling state, and he was a wrestler, and of course, moms talk, and they talk not only about what their kids do for extracurricular activities, but also how they behave at home, and there was a common theme between Eli and I, Eli and I, and like I'd already mentioned, the aggressive nature and picking on my sister and, you know, picking on other kids in a playful way, you know. Uh, my parents started thinking about getting me into, into wrestling, but it was several years after that because I was so heavy into baseball and competitive with that, with travel ball, <clears throat> not until my sophomore year in high school, uh, did I start competitively wrestling. And that was an interesting thing because I had a lot of natural athleticism but there was a lot to learn on how to control that when <laughs> fighting and wrestling against another human being, uh, no matter the size. But it was a unique start into it. And I'm glad I started when I did, but I also wish I would have started earlier. Um, I think maybe as any wrestler may have started, unless it's you Ohioans, you all start pretty young. Like you said, you were born in a wrestling mat. At least right. around one, near one. I don't know. I had to talk to my mom. You that. might have been. You might have been. But <laughs> there's a lot of stories that involve wrestling that I'm not like. They're not bad, but like, yeah, whatever. Anyhow, uh, was like hey, you were young. How old were you? Moved to like southeast? Do you remember? Um, I was pretty young. I was about three when we moved to Florida, and then moved from Tampa Bay, Florida, up to Atlanta area, and. Again, both those places that I, I grew up in were not huge wrestling states. Um, like I said, I was I was into baseball and I well, played football was, for one year. That's kind of was driving as like, do you have any friends or like family back in uh, Washington or anything? No, nobody. So I, that wondered, like, I, 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 I had no I mean? connection. I had no connection to the sport. My dad had done it maybe a year or two, uh, but nothing that really drove me to the sport until I met Eli, um, that I remember. I mean, if you talk to my father, he might have other words. You, 
I, I wanted you to wrestle your entire life, but it was your mother's choice and, you know, whatever it may be, but <laughs> yeah, you can, have, um, you can have that conversation. I'll let you handle that. Yeah. I'm not going to bring them into that, but <laughs> I, yeah, it was a relatively late start into wrestling and I kind of, it wasn't really much of a thought. I've always been competitive and I saw what Eli was able to do and how good he was. And um, unfortunately he didn't end up doing it in high school. He got burnt out because he was doing it since he was five or six. Well, see though, if you would have started early, that that's, I mean, that is a very real thing, man. Yeah. And I, I know a lot of really great wrestlers on my high school and also in the state that <clears throat> were much better than I ever was and had done it longer than I ever did. And they had a lot more potential, could have gone D1, could have gone to wrestle college, uh, but they chose not to. And when I talked to them, it was because they were burnt out. They were just tired of it. Yeah. They still love it, you know, yeah. but they were tired of competing. And they just don't want to do it um, some of them have found their way back into the sport, whether it be coaching or, um, <clears throat> or just being a spectator and watching, but. You know, one of the things that I find uh, really fascinating, I'm not going to do any name drops, but like it wasn't until probably the last year or so, some of the, some of the wrestlers that like, if you said their names, people would know them, right? Yeah. Like this sport, not only does it just beat up your body, but it, it, at some point you just have to make a decision. You're just like, do I want to be able to walk right? you know, and like lift my kid up over my shoulder. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, it is a thing. And some of the people also that have experienced the highest of highs, like more times than not, it just said, dude, it, it was not fun. I was smiling out there. I was winning. It wasn't fun, you know? Um, and that, that's enlightening to me because everyone else on the outside, everyone, like not everyone, because some people just hate schools because of the rivalries or whatever, but everyone yeah. else on the outside is like, this dude has got to be walking on on air, you know. As a wrestler, you get good at being tough. Yeah, I know, but like, and there's and a soul to that. Of course, there is. Yeah. But think think about the perception. Think about how your coaches are. It's a tough sport. You got to be tough, and you know, a lot of times you get told there's no place for weakness. And <clears throat> I agree with that, but there's also a space for sensitivity. Yeah, there's I think a space got, for I, empathy. I think, yeah, exactly. Like, you have to set guardrails there is what I'm going to call them. You know, like when you're driving. Yeah. Like, if you hit a guardrail on the right or the left, you're going off the cliff, right? So you have, you have to freaking drive that pretty straight, right? It's so time and place. Yeah. For sure. But, um, I mean, being tough is huge about it. The mental toughness is a, is a, a massive aspect. I think every wrestler, every competitor has dealt with difficulty when it came to the mental game whether it was self-confidence or you know you don't you doubt your abilities or you overestimate your opponent you know I, I think I think every single competitor and you've seen it at the highest stages this past wow. Olympics we had athletes that were struggling with their their mental health and they had to make tough decisions um, that no one ever wants to make and you know what you have to more power to it man I'm, I was I think you're talking about Simone Biles right I mean that's real. Absolutely. And that's yeah, real strength would, though. That That's true strength, man. It like, is. You got to know your limits because, you know, you, you see all these people in those, in those situations, you know, the comments, I don't, I'm not on social media, but uh, very much on social media. Uh, but I was hearing things and I've seen other instances where the internet trolls or the internet people are saying, how could you do that? How could you give up on the team? And how could you not compete? And yada, yada, yada. Yet they've never been on an Olympic beam. They've never been on an Olympic stage. They've never competitively done anything anywhere remotely close to that. Yeah, and they're throwing stones yeah, and they have no idea. Well, not only physically or mentally what it takes. Yeah, it just comes down to Teddy Roosevelt, one of the greatest presidents arguing me on that. I don't care, the man in the arena. If you ain't, if yeah. you're not oh, stuck in the arena, don't even talk about it. I don't, I don't want to hear it. You know what I mean? You don't know. It's such a great word. Yeah, I had. I'm rearranging my office. I got to find a new place. I used to get to stare at it every day, uh, but but it would reflect my glasses, and it's like no one wants to see me with like Bitcoin eyes on here. So anyhow, that's why. Um, you... 
So yeah, but I mean, I, it, it, we've come a long way, right? On that whole, on that whole, uh, the mental side, right? I mean, there are organizations now that are helping wrestlers strictly with the mental side of the sport. I mean, wrestling mindset. I I, I talked with uh yeah Buck Watkins this morning about that uh, from there, and I mean, get their emails it. all the time. Yeah, but think about it. I mean, you spend probably ninety ten training like 90 percent training and it, it, it's not a 90 10 game like if you're not pre- preparing your mind then you're like leaving out one whole aspect in, in my opinion how, how many times in in the dual season when particular guys are maybe out of the lineup or injured that week yeah <laughs> and you just saw them duel two days prior and they were fine or they posted that on kind Instagram of, and they're out watching a movie the night before. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Kind of kind of makes you think. You know, kind of makes you think. A part of part of physical preparedness is mental preparedness. Definitely. You part know of physical rest too. is mental rest. Right. I mean a, you, about you train. you train. I mean Oh yeah. That's a massive that's a massive uh part of not only the sport of wrestling, but officiating. And um not only is it a huge part of my life, um, I fell in love with fitness. I mean, I've been active my entire life, but I fell in love with fitness and what it does, not only for the body, but particularly, specifically the mind. Um, right when I started high school and then really when I started wrestling, because I figured if I'm going to be picking people up and putting them down, I might as well get stronger so I can do that more and easier. Yeah. And it just continues to build on that. And the better care you take your body, the better your mind's going to be. And you're going to find ways to think more positively and have a more positive impact on not only your life, but the other people around you. Um, and you just get down to the scientifics is you work out, you move your body, you sweat, you increase your heart rate. You, you feel better. Chemicals that actually make you feel good. <laughs> better, guess. better than, better than a lot of stuff, you yeah. know, and, and, the cool thing about it is that with my officiating, it certainly helps me. Absolutely. You know, being able to stay calm under pressure, being able to control your heart rate, control your breathing, being able to move effectively. Because a lot of times we're on our feet for 12 hours a day no, at no, these tournaments. Your back and your knees, man. It's, it's tough. Brutal. It's yeah. tough. And, you know, the, yeah, we're walking on a soft mat. Yeah. But yeah, but you're after basically this doing a thousand. On a hard Mat, like after you step off of a mat for a couple hours and you're walking on yeah. concrete or hardwood dude that there's that's yeah it's it's different it's, it hits different if you like if you like burpees officiating's for you <laughs> i don't like burpees but uh honestly but yeah the physical preparedness is huge um you know some of the top guys are big into their health and fitness i mean mike haggerty um one of the top guys for a long time is a huge health nut. He and I have had several conversations about the topic and I've seen him, um, you know, hold seminars on health and at at the different uh, national official seminars and clinics, he's had different demonstrations and it's, I, it needs to be a more talked about topic. Uh, Well, yeah, but the thing, the good thing is that you're ahead of the game, right? Because, um, I've been fortunate, you know, we're, we're, we're young in here. I don't know how we're going to keep it up. Cause we had some of the top officials, like right out of the gate, like, you know, but like uh, Kevin Lynch and uh, Matt Sorochinski, like well, during their interviews, he's talking about how much working out they're doing because he doesn't, you know, he wants to be mechanics. He wants to be in good shape. He also knows mm-hmm. I'm not getting younger. So I need to take care of my body so I can do this longer. And then he's talking about the hours of watching film and conversing with other officials. I'm like, Hey, I just saw this. Did you see this? You know, how could I, and, and, and no one ever talks about that. Like it's all, Oh yeah. You call, you know, you didn't call two on the edge. Right. Like, but no one sees all the stuff behind the scenes that even makes it possible for them to do that. Cause it's exactly why. Cause they don't see it. Yeah. No, that's why we're here. Right. (laughs) <laughs> exactly we're there we're here to debunk that officials are lazy and that we don't care about our health and um yeah, no mean, but they don't see they don't see that work behind the scenes yeah they don't, no one sees they the only, work behind the with the wrestlers either though right like no. uh, it must be so great to be you know 
wrestler X or whatever. Yeah, it must. Yeah, getting up at four o'clock in the morning and getting your workout before you go to school and then working out at lunch and then working out your practice and then maybe going and swimming laps. Yeah, that's awesome. It's fun, dude. Like, sign me up, right? Yeah. Yeah, come on. The competition's the fun part. The training is the stuff that sucks. Exactly, man. It's like it's like 5% of the time it's fun. 95% of it is just embracing the suck, right? Like they say in the military. Um, yeah. So we don't need to go into age here, but man, you've been doing this officiating thing the number the math is blows my mind actually so uh but before we get into that actually i want to keep going uh because the thing is is with most people their officiating story like starts and stops like after competition but yours started right when you competed you had a great high school career and then you went into college and you competed right where'd you go first yes, right um i originally wanted to go to annapolis i wanted to go wrestle there i wanted to be in the military that didn't end up happening and then i had an opportunity to go to the citadel uh didn't get to compete much because i got injured and then i really got my competition wings wet when i was at mmi got to wrestle under the haze winkles um but really what got me excited about competing and what drove me to still go to a military school was when i was at the Citadel, when I was going through that process, Jeff Reagan was a assistant coach there and his love and affinity for the, the, the game um, was pretty inspiring. And so then I had the opportunity, like I said, to go to Marion Military Institute, wrestle under uh, the Hayeswinkle twins. That was a pretty awesome experience, yeah. uh, humbling, very humbling. Humbling um, and probably intense at times. Very much. Those, <laughs> they're the nicest dudes ever. Um, sweetest, sweetest men. But they are also some of the scariest when they want to be. And don't ever try to wrestle one of those Hayeswinkle twins when they look all feeble and in their baggy sweatpants. Because I did that as a cocky 149-pounder first week on campus. And Dave hit me with the cleanest Jap wizard I've ever been hit with in my entire life. Didn't hurt at all, but I remember sitting on the mat. And as I was flying through the air prior to that, I counted every single tile on the ceiling. <laughs> yeah. You do it right. You, yeah. Your life flashes. It was amazing. Yeah. It was amazing. And then after that, that year, um, that time there, I kind of, changed my mind about the military and I had an opportunity to go back in state and finish my degree at Mercer. And so I went to an in-state school there uh, in the middle of Georgia and I was wrestling for their club program and wrestling and going to school and working and officiating when I could during the summer, during the holiday season. Um, and unfortunately my wrestling career kind of fizzled out, not really produced exactly what I wanted. Um, I went to a few club national championships that were held in Allen, Texas. And so nothing too elaborate, still really great wrestlers there. Um, but going back to the mental game, <clears throat> I attribute that largely to me not performing the way I wanted to. I got in my own head. I got in my own way. Well, I think everyone, not everyone, most people listening know about the kid. I think most clubs have, I, I was saying I was one of them is not fair. Cause I, I was mediocre, but I could, I, I could wrestle pretty well in the, in the, in the practice room in the room because I was really close to the mat all the time. I got to watch some of these great guys. Um, yeah. And then like when it mattered and you took me out, I was a complete nut job like <clears throat> i would sweat uh my yeah. first the districts match like the, the match before the go-to like someone had to pull me out of the, the locker room because i'm puking in the shower to bring me to the mat like i could not like i was yeah i was head case man at least um, you were in the shower yeah well i was smart i mean at least you're, <laughs> if you're gonna be a head case you gotta be smart about it um yeah. but i mean but yeah that guy that you're like oh my gosh they could just marry that up a little bit 
like the sky's the limit, right? I'm not saying I was that, but that's why like the mental side is so, so important. And then as a coach or whatever, like you need to be able to do, you, know, you could be the best te technician in the world, but if you can't relate to the uh, 15 or 16 year old kid, good luck. Like, yeah. Ha have fun, you know, cause it's, what, what are we there to do? You know, like promote the sport, have fun, win, you know? But yeah. So that was really tough. You know, I, I was the mental game with a huge, huge challenge for me yeah but it also I really believe that it helped me transform <clears throat> my love for the sport because no matter how many times I got beat down by my own doing I was able to build resilience and, and resiliency and, and continue to work and even though I didn't perform competition wise as as well as I had hoped or well as well as I know I could have. Um, I was still officiating and pretty early on, even while I was officiating in college, I was being realistic and being like, look, I may not accomplish what I want to as a wrestler. I may not be a national champion as a wrestler. I may not make it to the Hall of Fame as a wrestler. <clears throat> but I was like, you know, I can do something as an official. I can give back to the sport. And it was really my senior year in college. Um, the second semester, the wrestling team got disbanded for several reasons, just kind of fell apart. And so I didn't compete that last semester and I was working. And that's when I really got into the officiating and I was like, you know what, I'm going to hit this hard. And so I was doing summer tournaments, going to NHSEA nationals, senior nationals. And my trajectory into officiating was rather strange because I was always connected to the sport of wrestling. I was always doing some sort of officiating year round. And I was going to these national tournaments, but I never got an opportunity to do a Georgia state tournament. So I had actually done five NHSCA national championships, whether they were the duels or the individuals, senior it's nationals. For everyone, right? I mean, that's invite only. You have to place at state to even go, right? Go to those. Yeah. yeah. And in, even as official, you have to, you know, you got to be selected to do that. Yeah. And so I had done five of those tournaments before I even got an opportunity to do a Georgia State tournament. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Um, doesn't make sense, but it's the way it happened. The people that I fell in, in line with, the people I got connected with, um, were already in that scene, had done some college officiating, had done some high level, were guys that officiated me in college. Um, and I have photos. Uh, I wish I had them for this, but I have Will you send them to me? Like, yeah. We'll, we'll I've got photos of me officiating and my mentors in officiating officiating me in college that's awesome man um you know as I was wrestling there and so I was always connected and I was like guys how do I do what you do you know how do I get to your level because I know I'm not going to be wrestling this much longer how do I continue to be on the mat because I honestly loved wrestling so much and I loved what it had built me into and what it gave me that I was scared to lose it yeah. and so I was finding a way figuring out a way whether it was consciously or subconsciously to continue to give back to the sport and continue to love the sport and continue to be involved and I've always had an affinity for helping people you know coach people even when I was a young wrestler even you know my first year if I knew how to ankle pick better or if I knew how to lateral toss better than some of the guys in the room I was showing them hey this worked for me well I don't understand how coach explained it well maybe this would help you I just, just kind of how I've always been. So technique and technique comes pretty natural to you. Cause like some people just like, I'm one, I can't teach. I could not, like, I have to find the person that's going to do it because I'm a doer, not a, yeah. like, you know, left hand, right hand cut sort of thing. But it sounds like early on, you just, you could do it, but also understand. Kind of yeah. I, yeah. I, I, you know, I didn't understand it so much, much later in my life, you know, the last several years, but I have been, blessed with a, a gift to be able to communicate 
things. And when I was wrestling and I was learning how to do these moves, I was able to give that to other kids. And correct me if I'm wrong, have you ever experienced if your dad was ever your coach or your dad was telling you something and you're like, no, dad, you don't know what you're talking about. And then somebody said the exact same thing to you. And you're like, hell yeah, that's the best thing I've heard all day. (laughs) Oh dude, that came up the last episode, like almost the exact same thing. Right. It happens with the the people that you love the most or that love you the most. They'll tell you everything you need to know. And you just push them away. And then an official who maybe officiates (laughs) six matches over four years tells you the sky's orange and you're like yeah i didn't yeah it is yeah cool orange Man, sky. you're so right <laughs> you're so wise you know what i learned though uh about five years ago is sometimes in life and and not so much with parenting because it's just an interesting dynamic sometimes you just got to convince people that your idea is theirs yes <laughs> like you know what i mean uh everybody has a little bit of narcissism yeah yeah so that's yeah. what that is yeah if is. you have to convince somebody that it's their own idea yeah who there's a little what, bit of narcissism involved oh you're right because what you're saying is who cares who get, who cares uh who gets the credit let's just get the job done right and move on to the next thing like i mean yeah i could sit here and argue with you but i got five other things to do bro like sit back in your chair coach <laughs> we're gonna go wrestle um yeah so i feel like on the competition side we kind of like close the book and we're kind of going more into the official side right now is that fair to say Yes, sir. But yeah. I don't, I, there is a, there's a nugget in there that hasn't been mentioned yet. Uh, you were looking at going to Auburn for oh, a boy. while, weren't you? Yeah. So, hmm. <laughs> dude, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta go in. Cause I don't know if I'll ever get to tell this story. Yeah. So it was fun. So I was very active, like I mentioned, and Played baseball in high school, started wrestling in high school. What positions you play in baseball? I wanted to ask earlier. I was shortstop, right field, and I played catcher for a long time, but then I stayed small and everybody else got big, yeah. including the catchers. Yeah. Um, so even though I had the pop time, I had a cannon of an arm, I was fast, I could hit. I just wasn't as big as those six foot three, 16 year olds. You weren't Mike Piazza. We get it. <laughs> no, no. So that kind of fizzled out and I was able to play some more of the speed position um, yeah, sure, uh, opportunities. Important. Yeah. And it, it was fun. It was great. But then I ended up injur- injuring myself wrestling and that ended my baseball career because I couldn't throw anymore. Um, but then I continued wrestling because I'm stubborn and I wanted to wrestle. But meanwhile, my junior and senior year, um, I was, well, my entire uh, high school career, I was, my high school's mascot. And junior and senior year, I went to a cheerleading competition at the University of Auburn with the cheerleading team, and they happened to have a mascot competition. And again, I've mentioned I'm competitive. Yeah, so Picking up on that. I, I heard that there's a mascot competition, and my coach, the cheerleading coach, asked if I wanted to go, and I said, yes, I want to win it. So showed up, I won it the first year, won best overall. And then we go back my senior year, won it again. And then I got offered a, a position to be Aubby, Auburn's mascot. The Tiger, and Aubby the Tiger, just for people. That Aubby the Tiger, Iraq. AKA War Eagle. Yeah. Oh, still know how that's affiliated. But, I don't either, but. Um, that's all right. I don't but know why decided, Ohio State fans have to spell out the name of our state every time they see each other either, but some things are just above my pay grade. But anyhow, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> mysteries. Mysteries and conspiracies. I'm not going to start attacking another state. Uh, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Georgia's not too far out. But uh, no, so I, I, I had that great opportunity, and it was going to be a full ride. And I decided that I wanted to go wrestle in college. And so I took the initial opportunity to go to the Citadel and and I got injured and didn't really quite work out the way I wanted to. And you, you heard kind of the rest of the story. And then uh, I never really thought about that whole opportunity or opportunity missed until several years later when I'm bartending in downtown Atlanta after college. And one of the coworkers there just 
happens to overhear me telling the mascot story and he goes hold on you were almost the mascot at Auburn and asked what years to what years and he goes that's crazy my brother was actually Auburn's mascot and I go you're kidding and he says no and then I just asked him what is he doing now and he goes you don't want to know and then he tells me that he's a professional mascot making 180k a year not even as the main mascot and for i'm who? standing there for who? For who? in the chicago bulls <laughs> god sorry man hey we wouldn't be here talking right now you you know i'd be like on your waiting list to get a hold of you so i'm, yeah. I'm thankful for that so it's I was thinking about that heavy for several weeks, you know, <laughs> I'm slinging I cocktails, too, I'm waiting tables and, you know, working on, on some sports performance degrees and stuff like that to get, get my training up and running. And, um, so yeah, that was an interesting, interesting time and, and feeling in my life where my life would have been drastically different, but like you already said, and I completely agree, I'm thankful that that was not the path I chose. Um, because then that would have separated me from wrestling most likely. Um, I would not have been involved in the sport. I would have not more than likely continued to officiate. Um, And I would not be in the position I'm in now. I would not be sitting here with you being able to talk about my story and why I really love officiating in the sport of wrestling and what it's given to me. But, and honestly, I, you know, I laughed early, but I'm thankful too, because I told you this on the phone um, and all of my guests, not all of them, but most of them know, you know the average age of an official is getting up there. And um, it just so happens that there's like a cohort where like when a couple of them retire, at least in Ohio, I, I can confirm Texas is the same way. Um, it, it's just going to be an exodus and, and rightfully so they did their time. But yeah. what people are looking at right now, you know, you. Um, you're the future. I mean, you're the next, you're the people that are going to be doing the NCAA finals, you know, um, Jose Cervantes, who I got to uh, interview in episode four, young guy started fishing at age 15, like you are you seeing a pattern here. Um, this is the future. And so like, uh, I've said today in several episodes, I said it before, like until people see people like themselves doing something that they want to do that you can't put it up here in your head is that's a reality. Like until yeah. you see someone, you're like, oh, I can relate to them. I could do that. Um, and that's why this is such an important uh, call for me. And I think really for wrestling as a whole. Um, and, and that might sound over dramatic, but I mean, it, it's true, man. Like we need people because uh, less and less people are doing it right now. Right. And so we know in wrestling, it takes a special thing and you don't give up and you push through things like that. We need people more like you that are like hey it might have been hard to get in the door and that first five years was like gnarly right like I felt like maybe I was being disrespected I don't know I'm not putting trying to put words in your mouth um but you pushed through that and then now look what you're doing you're looking at your 15th year of officiating and uh an official that I really respect texts me and said hey if you're really trying to get one of the better young officials you need to talk to this guy so take it for what it's worth yeah take it yeah it's an honor Um, um so just tell me about like Let's go to, let's get a little less heavy, Bryce. I do that. Um, <laughs> let's talk, you know, officiating. So you talked about, you know, after it took five years to get that first state um, tournament, but I want to go back. Do you remember like your first time, like, let's say, I don't know, out of high school, maybe like when you're maybe like, it was a little more primary because you're were, you were competing for, you're competing, competing for a long time. Do you remember after the competition was done and like being on the mat and just like that first time, like doing it by that time you'd had some experience, but you just remember that feeling of like, this is the thing now that ties me to wrestling. There's nothing else ties me other than coaching. <clears throat> this is the yeah. thing. like, what are some of those emotions? It It's definitely tough. And I still feel them because anytime you get out there, I mean, I was just at the grappler fall classic in Myrtle beach a couple of weeks ago, which is a, a traditionally a Michigan health tournament um did you meet uh sean petty there yeah good dude right yeah yeah Yeah. cool i knew he was um, there he sent me a picture okay sorry go ahead um so i was i was there and i uh, you know it was great 
to be a part of the wrestling community again after the layoff and after everything that's been going on and kind of to see it to back to normal. But um, the, can you can uh, repeat the question? I, I just totally lost my train of thought. No, it's fine. Like just remember like kind of like some of your first times the emotions. before you felt like, yeah, before Thank you were hundred percent comfortable and you weren't a veteran like you are now, like, yeah yeah because yeah. what i want to do is i want to hear that experience like mentally and all that stuff and then i want to compare it to what year six when you're on this you're on the floor for your first state tournament you see where i'm trying to go yeah okay. so i did i always have those emotions i mean like i was mentioning at the fall, grappler fall classic you always want to get on the mat and wrestle you know you always want to be there and be like man and for me i was never at those high level tournaments in high school right so i never got that opportunity i went to super 32 a few times and you know senior nationals my senior year but i never really traveled out and i never got those big those big exposure matches and big competition matches so being there you're still going to have those emotions like there i wanted to wrestle i was like oh man this is so awesome you're in the national semifinals or you're in the national finals or at super 32. But right when I got done with competing in college and I was like, look, I don't have any more time putting the headgear on. Um, all my wrestling on the mats going to be coaching. I may go to a couple open tournaments. Um, and I'm still looking into doing that from time to time, maybe freestyle. I don't know, but um, getting right onto the mat officiating it was kind of like, man, I miss being there in the center of the circle, but I was also just very relieved. I was still on the mat and I still got to experience all the same emotions, the excitement, the nervousness, got to, to experience all the same smells, good and bad. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the same emotions when you, you, you raise that kid's hand and, or you're, you're sitting off a mat and you're watching a really intense match you're feeling the emotions of not only those wrestlers because you were just there, but then you're also feeling the emotions of that official because you're doing now that as your career in wrestling. Um, so yeah, it was definitely unique and I still feel a lot of those same feelings today, but it's more so completely tailored towards the job at hand. I still feel the excitement. I still feel the nervousness. I still feel uh, the adrenaline, but instead of thinking about how it used to be to compete, I'm thinking about how I can perform at my best. So these kids can compete at their best. And so now I've just learned to hone those feelings and hone those emotions to doing what I'm there to do, to do the job and to do the best job I can for those competitors, because that's what they expect that's what the coaches expect that's what the fans expect and i know how it felt to be on the wrestling mat as a competitor and be at the you know for lack of better terms the receiving end of poor officiating or left less than effortful officiating yeah and it's not fun and it's unfortunate and coaches and yourself and anybody that's a lover of wrestling is always going to say and should say, don't blame the officials. Don't blame anybody else, but yourself and your preparation. Right. Yeah, Although, they leave it out of their hands, but it's still, there it's are still those stinks. times yeah. that there's been some mistakes made and matches lost and, you know, but nonetheless, you got to learn to, to hone all of those emotions that you may have felt as a wrestler or a competitor or a coach. And if you're there wearing the stripes, you've got to be able to focus those down to do the best job for those kids on the mat. Um, and also to do the best job for yourself. Yeah. You got to have some pride in yourself, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Pride, but not the good pride, not like much. pride in a job well done, not, not yeah. the boastful pride. Um, just yeah. pride in what you do and, and, and taking accountability. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right. And I'm going to do it well. Right. Um, and you're so not in this, good call. you're not in this for the money. If you're doing <laughs> no, it for the money. Yeah. I mean, and, and shoot, 
if you think about it, you're not getting paid enough for all the stuff you go through. Yeah. And and this isn't, this isn't, I'm not complaining, but I mean, we're a necessary evil as officials. Yeah. Well, you said it early, like you said what your motivation is earlier. I don't know if you are, you're aware that you said it, but you said it, you said, I want to, I want to give back to the sport. That's what you, yeah. And that's my pure passion. That's my pure purpose. And, And that's the thing though. And we had this conversation offline is, a lot of people say that, but their actions maybe don't show that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can tell when someone says it and then you see their actions and you're like, yep, okay, cool. Check that box off. Mm-hmm. Solid, yeah. you know? Um, so you've been an official for 15 years now. Um, you, you already said a, a, this earlier too, but I want to make sure it's out there because, you know, I, I, I like talking with you because you talk a lot of, the same way I try to talk. You say blessed a lot. I really like that word because it puts you in a positive frame of mind. Uh, get it gets to, behind you there, isn't it? What? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, sneaks up on me, but um, you're competitive. Yeah. And uh, so at the end of the day, let's say you're done officiating. Um, and you're looking back at it, like, what do you hope that you get out of it? Like, what's the, what would a win look like for you there? Like, what account, what do you want to accomplish? Are there any tournaments or sessions that you want to make sure that you check off? Um, what's that look like for you, man? As far as accolades though, yeah. is that what you're referring at, to? Yeah. Cause it's okay to earn accolades, right? That, that's the result yeah. of doing your job well and doing it for a, 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 you know, a good period of time. Yeah. So what well, else do you this... want to check off? I'll say this first. I just want to be a value. I want to be a value and I want to provide the same excitement, the same confidence and the same sense of purpose and other young officials and other wrestlers that want to have an opportunity to make an impact because yeah, you're there as an official, but you're there with an opportunity to change a life to 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 learn and provide lessons and you have the opportunity to touch young men and I know I'm still young but if it weren't for my coaches and the officials and the quality men that I've had in my life and quality role models teaching me lessons even when I didn't think I needed them or think I was learning them um the times I've had officials pull me aside after a match and be like, look, you can't act like that. This is why you got penalized. Or, um, you know, I've, I've been able to talk to officials now and they're like, well, you, you know, if you could have done this or you should have done that, it teaches you the lessons, no matter where they're coming from. You have an opportunity to impact people. But um, so, yeah, I just want to be a value and I want to be able to give back to the sport of wrestling and bring more people to it. And I am just incredibly excited about the growth and numbers of the sport, not only in boys and girls wrestling. Um, When I get to officiate the young girls, I was at a tournament earlier in South Georgia um, to where they had the girls wrestling and there was young, young girls there. That was awesome. That got me super pumped. Same thing at the Grappler Fall Classic. There was young ladies there and they were warming up, you know, six, seven, eight years old and going into high school and competing competing and did the same thing you did. Yeah, and uh, it's contagious. (laughs) This takes a lot. um, And just the strength that they build, you know, the character that they build and the confidence they build as young ladies is really awesome. And it's similar to the positive emotions I feel when I see these young men um, build their confidence and it's really exciting if you have a wrestler when they're young in high school and they're just a nutcase, right? You penalize them every time. And then by their senior year, they're the guy that comes out and shakes the official's hand and is the epitome of sportsmanship. And you're not sitting back saying, I did that, but you're like, I like to think that I have had a part in that. And then when they come up to you, on their graduation night or they come up to you when they're wrestling in college and they're like, man, I, I want to thank you for helping me straighten up. I've had that. And, and that's awesome. really, that's, and, and you'll, it is not, really cool. You're going to have a whole bunch more of them. I mean, 
Um, I, I'm good at uh, throwing out cliches, but I mean, it takes a village, you know, to raise a child and wrestling is a village. Yeah. And uh, it's a village that's there. Um, I, I think, you know, now more than ever, we're able to connect and bring people together and share stories. You know, a couple of years ago, there weren't too many people telling official stories, right? Watching the wrestlers mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And I just like, hearing the stories because they're just unique it's a different um different lens i guess to look at this yeah. through but uh like last, this weekend actually it was pretty cool i saw a kid that wrestled a few years after me um same school i know him really well really accomplished wrestler wrestled at ohio state for a while um and he said something he's like man keep doing you know and maybe it's blowing sunshine my way i don't know i don't know him to do that He's like, I actually, he's like, these wrestling official stories, I thought it was going to be dumb. And I'm like, thanks, bud. Um, and he's like, it's yeah. actually, it's actually more entertaining than hearing, you know, not a post-match interview because those things are sweet. He's like, than hearing these like um, stories from the wrestlers, because I already know, I already know yeah. where they went to high school. I already know what they did in college. I already know all that stuff. But I don't know the guy that was calling, you know, my near falls in high school. I don't know that you know a wrestling coach said hey man you got to get your your acting gear and like you know wrestling changed my life or whatever like you know that's yeah. not me that's another great podcast if you're not listening to it um but we've got to wrap this thing up because it's been over an hour um and I, i'm gonna do another episode with you if you'll have me but i want to end with the big challenge that i have for you yeah um, we talked about it offline because i didn't want to surprise you so you had an hour to think about it now it's time to probably knew what my answer was good um i'm gonna ask you can you commit right now on video to for the next 365 days so for 12 months just do one thing a month that you have not been doing to promote the sport of wrestling specifically um officiating the great lessons it teaches in addition to what you learn from wrestling and just uh you know just try to put share your story um and I said this in another episode is wrestlers tend to be a little bit blue collar kind of, or rough around the edges mm-hmm. and people that are blue yeah. collar and rough around the edges. It's not about me. It's about we kind of, they don't like to talk about themselves, you know, like that. Yeah. You know? And um, that's great. It's a good quality to have, but not when you're trying to promote something, <laughs> you know, yeah. you got to talk about it because if no one knows about your product, no one's going to buy it. So um, True. one, can you commit? And if so, what can you do, man? Absolutely. I'd love to. Um, I definitely can commit to that. Um, <clears throat> and it's, this is actually kind of funny. You mentioned this is this topic in general, uh, what can I do? What can I help to grow the sport of wrestling and grow officiating in particular? Um, I mean, the easiest thing nowadays would to be to do social media posts and the easiest thing for me would to be post photos and brief little stories about how officiating has impacted, challenged me, um, provided me growth and opportunity to continue doing something I love, um, which is be involved in the sport of wrestling. But then also something that I've wanted to do a long time for a long time is continue to grow these scholarship programs that are popping up around the Uh, around the states and what i mean by that is providing either funds or used gear or um other modes to incentivize these younger officials to get into it because i know when i started officiating um especially in high school well only in high school you don't get paid till the end of the year and so you're you're spending all these hours driving the tournaments and you're spending money on equipment and wristbands and yeah this stuff doesn't cost a lot but for a college kid it adds up you know it adds up and being able to provide means to get started or provide scholarships for these younger officials to go out to the midwest and do tournaments when they're from the southeast or be able to go up to the virginia beach nationals and get that exposure not only to that world-class wrestling but also those different officials that you can learn a lot from I mean, I can still think back to the the days I was at Nationals and I met Jay Cox and Kevin Lineage and, you know, McCormick and, and, and Haggerty and all these guys, like way back in the day. And if I hadn't had the opportunity to go to that tournament, I would never met them. I would never have been maybe inspired 
to get to their level. Um, so providing the means and the resources for younger officials to get involved and to be able to travel just like the wrestlers need to be able to travel to get the best competition. I think that's an invaluable asset to be able to continue to support and promote. I like it, man. That's a completely unique idea. And the fact that you came up with it that quickly, it's obviously says you've been thinking about it. Um, don't know what, how much I can do, but I'm here to support it. I actually, uh, we're, don't jump off after this. I want to pick your brain on yep. a couple of things. Um, man, Evan, thank you so much for your time, dude. Been looking forward to this since we talked, we spoke. We, uh, we yeah. had, what, less than five-day turnaround. So uh, we obviously wanted to make it happen, and we did, to your point, yeah. for wrestlers. Well, I thank you, Bryce, and everyone listening. I appreciate it. Thanks for bearing with us. I know I probably mumbled and jumbled no, a lot. No, man, but, you're awesome. Uh, you're awesome. Let's keep doing the thing, and keep loving the sport of wrestling and giving back. All right. I'm in. I'm I, I sign me up. All right. Stay online. All right. Roger that. Thanks guys.